yet as the government you know wants uh, uh these metals to be taken out of the ground to go green and so so what happens you know uh metal uh, uh supplies dwindle you know that's why you've seen silver supply uh in the mining sector be flat you know it's been between 800 and 830 million ounces a year for the last 10 years and it's not going up there's no big silver mines coming on on stream and who who's going to make the investment you know, there's, there are silver mines around the world, which we know of, that, that are low grade, that, that have substantial ounces in them, but it's going to require $100 silver for those ounces to come out of the ground. Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics. We are live at the Rule Symposium, and I'm joined by Keith Newmeyer of First Majestic Silver and what has been a nice first half of the year in the silver market? You know, something you're happy about. A lot of people in the silver community cited. And nice to catch up with you here at the conference. Um, get to interact with investors in the midst of what's happening. A little bit of a lighter mood. And first of all, welcome on in. How are you today? Well, it's nice seeing you, Chris. And uh, great to have this opportunity. We haven't seen each other for quite some time. Yeah, well, it's good to be here in person. I know you spoke a little while ago. And... Perhaps any thoughts from the conference, conversations you've had, the mood in general of the in resource investing craft? Well, Rick always puts on a good conference. You know, we've been coming to these conferences you know, for over a decade, and uh, it's been here in Boca Raton for, I think this is its third year. A great venue, uh, brings a lot of people here. And, uh, the weather's obviously quite interesting, uh, being so warm and humid the way it is, but it's kind of a nice break from the West Coast, so we're... We're happy to be here. And, and uh, for me, you know, just talking to shareholders, um, when I come to a conference like this, no matter what it is or who's, who's, who's managing it, uh, it, it, you know, I measure the success on, on how many investors I actually meet, you know, how many shareholders are actually me. And then this conference and others that are, are run by um, uh, this group um, you know, always attract, you know, people that are actually invested in First Majestic and First Mining and, you know, other companies that I'm interested in. Yeah, and it's an interesting demographic here because obviously there's a lot of gold and silver in there, also other resources. What are some of the generalists that you talk to seeing in silver? Is there still that fear that a couple of months from now, maybe silver will be back to $25 and a hesitancy to jump in? Or what's the feeling you get from people who are less of the gold and silver hardcore enthusiasts and a little bit outside that? Are they getting ready, do you think? No, I don't think so. I, and, and then when you say generalists, there are no generalists. They're gone. So they, 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 they ran from this market in, in 2012, and they've never come back. So, you know, the big mutual funds, the big pension funds, um, they're all chasing NVIDIA and, and, and Tesla and Apple, and uh, they don't give a shit about the mining sector, and uh, they're nowhere even close to looking. So where do you think that leaves us? Obviously, we hear goals to triple solar and and, and net clean energy uh, by 2030. We have the numbers that show a deficit. We do see the decline in inventory. So it seems like a bit of a divergence. Well, I could probably count the n number of institutions that are following this sector on one hand. And uh, it's pretty shocking. Um, if you look at our shareholder base back in 2010, 2011, you know, we had, um, you know, we had a half a dozen uh, shareholders that would, that own 5% of the company each. And uh, these are the big pension funds in Canada, the big uh, uh, generalist funds in the United States, and uh, they're long gone and they've never shown up again. Um, the, the big funds that own the mining sector today are really ETFs, uh, you know, GDX, GDXJ, you know, some of these other ETFs that are out there. And it's all passive money. Uh, there's no fund manager. The only reason why they own your stock is because of volume. And, uh, and, they, and they adjust their portfolio, generally speaking, on a daily or weekly basis based on your volume. And that's all they care about is how many shares you trade and then what, what they... And then, then not, not only that, they, they lend the shares out for a fee and they short your stock. So, you know, it's... <laughs> It's a, it's a crazy sector, um, and you know that, that's why you you look at the GDX and you see what it's trading at compared to five years ago. You know we have twenty four hundred of gold and thirty dollars thirty one dollars silver, and yet these stocks are 
you know, last time silver hit 30 bucks, first Majestic stock was 30 bucks. So, you know, it, it's going to change, but we need, we need, you know, these tech stocks to crash like we did in 2000. You know, we saw the NASDAQ um, drop from 5,000 uh, in March of 2000 to 850, you know, three years later, you know, 80% uh, uh, a fall. So all that money, where did it go? It went into real estate, it went into the resource sector, went into gold, silver, and, you know, that silver went from five bucks to 50 bucks and gold went from 240 to, you know, 18 something. Um, and that's all going to happen all over again, but you just don't know when that's going to be. Yeah, and it's really interesting to see how we've seen the rally without that happening yet. So on one hand, you could say if the Western markets do get involved, certainly would be a nice scenario to watch unfold. And actually, we did see earlier this week that the gold ETFs, after they had a string of consecutive outflows, finally had an inflow last month, a small one, but hopefully some signs of things changing. Uh, another thing that has been changing a little bit that you've been involved with. We've talked before about the petition to have silver listed as a strategic metal in Canada. I want to touch on uh, in some of the comments you had about the U.S. Yet, amongst all of that, we had that report come out uh, about a month or so ago that the U.S. Defense Department is now allocating money to minerals, securitizing minerals in Canada. Possibly, uh, I believe it was 15 million the first round, but the act calls for up to half a billion dollars and anything you could share there about that trend we're seeing also uh any further update from canada and then maybe we'll touch on what the u.s said as well well you're dealing with politicians and uh and that's part of the problem because they're not engineers they're not geologists you know a politician you know will say hey you know we want to go green and we want to bring green energy to the world and we want to replace fossil fuels or or at least supplement fossil fuels with other technologies, and uh, you know they're now they're now talking talking about nuclear, which is surprising. That's uh, but you know pre previous to that they were just basically talking about wind power and solar panel or uh, solar power. But um, yet on the other side of the equation, they they don't want to permit mines. So so you know um, you know one of my companies that I'm I'm involved in, it's been eight years in permitting. And uh, we don't expect a permit for at least another two to three years. Um, the, the the investment that has to be made on an annual basis is about $20 million. Uh, so, you know, over a 10 year period, that's $200 million. So, you know, a mining company, that's tough. You got to raise that money every single year and you're, you're at risk to the government. You don't, you don't know if you're going to get your permit. So, so, uh, you know, it's all risk money. It's all speculative money. It's hard money to raise because you know, the people that are putting money into the mining company know that it's a long game. It's not, they're, they're not going to get a return tomorrow. You know, it's, it, it might take 10 plus years, 20 years in some cases uh, to get a return on that money. So it's, it's very tough money to raise. And uh, yet yeah, there's a government, you know, wants uh, uh, these metals to be taken out of the ground to go green and the mining sector says, well, screw it. So, so what happens, you know, uh, metal, uh, uh, supplies dwindle. You know that's why you've seen silver supply uh, in the mining sector be flat. You know it's, it's been between 800 and 830 million ounces a year for the last 10 years, and it's not going up. There's no big silver mines coming on on stream, and who who's going to make the investment? You know there's there are silver mines around the world which we know of that that are low grade that that have substantial ounces in them, but it's going to require 100 dollars silver for those ounces to come out of the ground. And, and even if we hit a hundred dollars silver tomorrow, the mining co company still wouldn't make the investment because they, they, because they would think, oh, geez, you know, how long is it going to last? You know, we, we need a hundred dollars silver for the next 30 years in order to pay back our investment that it's going to cost to build this mine. So what, what executive team is going to um, uh, bet on, uh, you know, hundred dollars silver for 30 years, right? Um, it's never happened before. So it's all just basically risk capital. Uh, if, if the governments would loosen up the controls and say, hey, look, we actually are going to put our mouth behind our, you know, uh, or put our actions behind what we're saying, and we're actually going to let the mining sector bring the metal out of the ground and get it into industry, and um, uh, then my, the mining sector might decide, okay, well, we'll, we'll work with government. 
you know, but we, you know, we need zinc, we need copper, we need silver, we need these critical metals uh, to be extracted. You know, these are extractive industries, and if we expect to accomplish all the things we want to accomplish, the government's got to do joint ventures with the mining sector. Simple as that. Yeah, and that's why it's interesting to see that the Defense Department has actually been doing that, because you raise a good point. It's a tough capital cycle for many people to be patient through, and I've wondered, you know, if we hit a recession or if there's a downturn, which I think there's a case to be made, that's certainly a possibility. What is, when you think about how would the government, we'll leave the Fed aside, but how would the government respond? They want to stimulate things. I mean, what's one of the key areas that they would target? Obviously, we've seen the green investment and just interesting to see that now government also investing in some of these mineral projects. Mm -hmm. One other question on the U.S. Uh, that, again, we touched on a little bit earlier this year, but I know you had mentioned that you had spoken with the U.S. as well about having silver as a strategic mineral there. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was interesting what they told you, and perhaps you could share that and, and the latest that you've heard from them. You know, I don't understand the politics behind how they choose certain metals over others. You know, I, I looked at the list. Uh, when it came out last summer, and this is what really started the whole process. And, you know, for me, I look at silver as a strategic metal. I've been saying I called silver a strategic metal over 10 years ago. And, uh, uh, you know, everything we do, even in this, this interview right now, and, you know, all the, the wars that are going on around the world and, uh, you know, whatever the case may be, everything that we do as a human race requires silver. And if, it, if it's not strategic, then the, what the hell is this strategic? You know, they... On that list, there's probably 10 metals I've never even heard of, right? And they're the smallest, you know, you know, uh, metals there are out there. And, and uh, sure, okay, fine, you could make an argument for it that maybe they're in interesting. Whether there's substitution available for some of those metals, I don't know. But um, there is no substitute for silver. Uh, silver is the most electrically conductive of a metal. It's the most reflective metal. Uh, it's got antibacterial uh, 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 properties to it as well. So it's used in all kinds of applications. And uh, there's nothing that, you know, the solar panel companies have tried to replace silver with other metals They're using aluminum and others, and they failed doing it because the productivity of a, the solar panels dropped to a degree where they weren't really worth much. So they actually, silver consumption of solar panels today are actually higher than they were five years ago as a result of the solar panel companies waking up to the fact that they're producing crappy solar panels and they had to smarten up and produce a, a better product and that required a little bit more silver and that's what we've been doing so um yeah i, I yeah. you know talking about, about you know the government's going back to that um you know we're we're pushing the u.s government they're they they're going to come out with a new list in 2025 we're lobbying them we hope to see solar show up on that list canada just published their list and lo and behold you know politicians did not include silver on that strategic metals list for Canada, which is quite disappointing, despite the fact that we had several meetings with them. Uh, we're now continuing that lobby effort. We're not stopping, uh, but unfortunately, that next list is not coming out until 2027. Right. Well, I think there's still steps and progress made in the effort to get it out there, and fortunately not getting the answer from Canada yet that we'd like, but... Um... There are efforts going on in Europe. I think France is putting out a, a, a list uh, in the next uh, several months. And I think there's another, a couple other com uh, countries also doing the same. Okay. Um, in terms of some of the developments with First Majestic, now that you've been a couple more months underway with the mint facility in Nevada, I know you've wanted to take as much metal out of the COMEX system as possible. Anything that you've seen of note or just as the... Uh, Getting, getting more reps going through that process? Anything that you've taken away so far? Well, we've received lots of compliments. Um, I think it's really kind of shaking things up a little bit out there. Um, you know, the, mints, the minting industry is quite a small industry. Uh, and, you know, we're trying to, uh, you know, just get more metal out there. Uh, you know, the, the, the mints uh, have been constrained, you know, through their own production capabilities. And uh, uh, we were getting constrained in our sales because, they just simply wouldn't produce what we wanted them to produce. So I decided that we should just open up our own mint. So uh, we did that, and we've been producing since, I think, about March or April. And uh, it's, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. Something that we're very proud of, and our team is very excited about. 
And I see you have some nice coins you're selling over at the First Majestic booth here at the Real Symposium. So That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People, if you want to come stop on by, you can get some of those here. And Keith, obviously, you also have had the water issue at La Encantada, which I know you've identified. And so you can give an update on how things are coming along there. Sure. Yeah. In June of uh, 2023, we lost one of our water wells. You know, mining is a very water intensive uh, uh, industry, obviously. Um, so lo losing a third of our water was a big dent on production. So, you know, uh, you know, when you lose production like that, your costs are going to go up. Uh, uh, and that's what happened. So we've been producing ounces there at quite a high cost for the, for the last three or four quarters. Uh, we discovered a new water well in April. Uh, we're now back up to 3,000 tons a day there. Uh, so it's not quite normalized, but we're getting back to normal. So over the next quarter, we expect to see uh, Lincoln Tata become profitable again. It certainly comes at a good time. Uh, obviously, we don't know what the silver price will do for the rest of the year, but mm. should we have the water issue resolved and even stay at current levels, certainly sets you guys up for yeah. a good second half. And uh, I guess well, I, I predicted $30 silver this year, so um, I, I think I'm going to change my target to 35 <laughs> okay, I, I think that'll work for a lot of people. I, yeah. I know there's some who say 50 year bust, they're not smiling till then. Although, wow. in, in some ways, really, uh, I don't know if this has gotten as much attention as it should, but th to me, it's a bit historic that we're seeing the $30 silver. He ruled out the couple hours in 2021. This is only the third time in history we've been there. Mm -hmm. Very brief spike in 1980, mm -hmm. stayed up longer in 2011. So I think a good step in the right direction, especially in a world where we see people pulling back their resources and becoming more protective. Mm -hmm. And keep the last thing. And seasonality as well, you know, because June well, and July are, are tend to be weak uh, months for the metal prices. And, uh, uh, you know, we're right in the depths of the summer. And, you know, for silver to break through 30 and hold that this number, this, this level, you know, through one of the weakest periods uh, on the on a cyclical basis, I think that's very positive. And in the face of the higher interest rates, which now we're seeing that one shift as well. A lot of forecasts for cuts coming out. We'll see what the rest of the year holds. But last thing I wanted to just run by, you had some drilling results recently you guys put out from San Dimas. And if you mm -hmm. could share your thoughts, I know you're pretty excited about what you found there. So, Well, we have a big exploration budget this year. We're spending $39 million over all the assets and uh um, we're having great success at St. Demons, which we put some uh, news out, as you said, um, that came out a couple of weeks ago. We're, we're, we just start drilling tomorrow, I don't know, probably next week at uh, Jarrah Canyon. So it's the first, and we're putting 10 million into Jarrah Canyon, uh, the first investment there since we shut down that operation. And we're hopefully putting a news release out towards the end of August on expiration results at, at Santa Elena, uh, which has been ongoing. And uh, we're excited about that project as well. Okay, and Keith, we'll wrap up for here. I, I know you've got a lot going on here at the conference today, but uh, again, you can find out more about Keith and First Majestic Silver at firstmajesticsilver.com. And Keith, pleasure to see you as always, and uh, congratulations on getting through some of the challenging years and in an environment in a good direction, and great to catch up with you and see you again. Yeah, it's great. Great seeing you again. And people can follow, follow me on Twitter as well. You know, just Keith underscore Newmeyer and... Uh, I try to put all the first majestic stuff out there and first mining gold news as well. All right. And Keith's Twitter handle in the description field below. And thanks for tuning in. Keith, great to see you and enjoy the rest of the show. Thanks, Chris.